puzzle for you. Roald Dahl and Walt Disney, two of the 20th century's greatest storytellers, have been a part of many a childhood, transporting us to fantasy lands with unforgettable characters. Here, the 1971 film version of Roald Dahl's book, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. What do you think will come of that? And of course this, Walt Disney's classic 1937 feature, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Hi -ho, hi -ho. Both works feature magical little characters. Dolls, hard-working Oompa Loompas, and then the equally industrious dwarves of Disney's first ever full-length animation. But in 1942, it was another set of mischievous creatures, penned by the then unknown 20-something doll, that united these two great talents to work on a film that ultimately never got made. Here's the writer himself talking about this in 1984. I was very lucky because my first little book I wrote was called The Gremlins, which was bought by Walt Disney. I'm Gerald Scarf, and having created illustrations for both Dahl and Disney, the idea that they work together on a film fascinates me. And you wish upon a star Makes no difference who you are Anything your heart desires will come In fact, I was partly inspired to become an artist after seeing Pinocchio as a child later working at the Disney Studios in Burbank, California, as production designer on the 1997 film Hercules. I also met Roald a couple of times, and later, after his death, I was asked to design the sets and costumes for the Los Angeles Opera's 1998 stage production of his book, Fantastic Mr. Fox. So what became of their film that took young RAF pilot Dahl to Hollywood to mingle with the likes of Spencer Tracy and Charlie Chaplin, even having tea at the White House? Why did the project never see the light of day? Did it have its own gremlins in the works? Dahl's career as a fighter pilot in World War II was cut short after he crash-landed his aircraft. That's when he turned to the written word and the gremlins as he told Roy Plumley in Desert Island Discs in 1979. Uh, you served in the Middle East. You were rather badly shot up. Yes, I, I uh, finished up uh, <laughs> in a sort of pile of flames on the ground. Oh, <laughs> but I, I recovered from that and went on flying a bit. Yes, you went to Greece. And you ended the war. You were sort of insulated out of active flying. You, you ended up in the United States as assistant air attaché, which sounds rather a, a glamorous post. Well, I started up in that post. I didn't last very long because... I'm a tactless sort of fellow. So Dahl is now behind a desk working in public relations in Washington, D.C., writing down his flying experiences for propaganda purposes to get the United States more on side in the war. This led to his first published story, Shot Down Over Libya, which appeared in the Saturday Evening Post. But there was another tale rattling around in his brain, which had been sparked by an RAF folk story traced back to the 1920s. The Gremlin concept came from the early days of combat flying when things were constantly going awry. John Baxter is the author of Disney during World War II. The early biplanes were rickety affairs. You know, wires would snap and fuel lines would rupture and things like that. And that was the origin of the Gremlin myth because uh, the pilots decided it would be a good tongue-in-cheek way of coping with that problem by attributing all these mishaps to these little fellows called gremlins, you know, these little mischief makers. Being a serving officer, Dahl had to ask his superiors for permission to publish the story in a magazine. The original gremlin story has them as tree-dwelling wood creatures. The British are building aerodromes at the beginning of the war. They knock down the gremlins' trees to build these aerodromes. The gremlins get very upset decide to attack all of the airplanes that they see, and eventually the British flyers convince the gremlins that it's the Germans' fault that the trees were knocked down in the first place, and if they help them beat the Germans, they can go back to living peacefully in their woods. The main character is the pilot Gus, who bears a strong similarity to Dahl, a successful pilot who crash lands while on patrol and is injured. However, in Dahl's children's tale, the pilot is brought down by a six-inch-tall gremlin who drills holes into his aircraft. 
And as the gremlins are invisible to non-pilots, a key premise of the story is that all damage has to be explained in the real world too, such as bullet holes and natural wear and tear to the aircraft. Hello there, welcome to the Royal Dar Museum and Story Centre. There's your golden ticket. Please enjoy your adventure. Thank you very much. I look forward to seeing what you've got. The museum in Great Missenden is in the village where Dahl lived for 36 years until his death in 1990. We're just going to head into the archive. And it holds many a treasure relating to the Gremlins project. I'm just going to take out a box now of material relating to the Gremlins and we can go and find out more. OK, I can't wait to see what's in it. Rachel White is archivist and collections manager at the museum, home to a rather special item that marks the start of Dahl and Disney's relationship. This is fascinating. What is this? This is the telegram that Roald Dahl received from Walt Disney, basically saying that he's received the copy of the Gremlins and he thinks it has possibilities. It's to Flight Lieutenant Roald Dahl, care of the British Embassy, Washington, D.C., and it's dated, what is that, July the 13th? 1942. Uh, and it says, Sidney Bernstein has sent me your story of the Gremlins. Believe it has possibilities. Would be interested in securing this material and we'll have... Uh, Mr. Fitel in Washington contact you regarding same. And it's signed, Walt Disney, Burbank, California. That's amazing, absolutely incredible. Mm. Rather fortuitously, Dahl's superior, Sidney Bernstein, was not only head of the British intelligence service, but a movie producer. Bernstein spotted the story's potential and knew to contact Disney. John Baxter again. Walt Disney was interested in the Gremlins project for two reasons. One, the concept of gremlins was all over the place. You know, there was a huge air war going on, so there were hundreds of thousands of men flying combat, and the gremlin myth grew exponentially. It felt very topical. And then the second reason was Walt was completely smitten with aviation and wanting to present war aviation as straight entertainment. That's how he saw the gremlins project. And for the British air military, Dahl's quirky story about these creatures was seen as an opportunity to strengthen relations with the US, especially as the country had only just entered the war seven months earlier, in December 1941. However, for Disney, there was one stumbling block. Because the myth was in common use in the RAF among pilots, he couldn't copyright the gremlin's name. So Disney and Dahl did a deal after the story was published in a magazine. The agreement was that Walt would have his artists do the illustrations. Paula Sigmund Lowry worked in the heart of the Disney Company as an archivist for almost 15 years, based at its headquarters in Burbank, California. By doing this, Disney, although he couldn't establish copyright on the name of the Gremlins, he could establish ownership rights for the look of the Gremlins, and that would allow him to proceed in making eventually a film, which was also part of the agreement. And both Dahl and the British Air Ministry would actually have approval of the story and the overall film version, which was really rare for Walt to give that kind of permission to a third party. The RAF stamp of approval also meant that, in exchange for the film rights, a small cash payment would be donated to the RAF Benevolent Fund, along with a share of royalties generated by any Disney Gremlins books. The story was published in Cosmopolitan magazine in the States in December 1942, with Dahl using the nom de plume Pegasus. However, when Dahl saw the sketches prior to publication, his strong ideas about his creations started to become clear. He was not thrilled with the design of the characters. He thought they should be all wearing little bowler hats. And instead, the gremlins were wearing leather flying helmets with horns on them, um, and they wore goggles. He didn't feel they were, they looked like the gremlins that he had envisioned. And he was unhappy about that. Dahl wrote to Disney saying as much. He was told it was too late by then to make changes, but that it would be time to work on their look for the film itself. In November 1942, Dahl took a couple of weeks' holiday from his desk job in Washington and found himself heading out to Hollywood to work on the book illustrations and to be around as the film developed. Donald Sturrock is the author of the official biography, Storyteller, The Life of Roald Dahl. 
and has also directed several stage and TV productions of Dahl's work. He was very, very excited and told his mother in a letter home that, you know, on the first night he'd arrived in Hollywood, Disney threw a party and all sorts of famous people attended, like Spencer Tracy, Dorothy L'Amour, Charlie Chaplin was there. And, you know, Roald really felt, I think, that the Gremlins were going to be his passport to fame within the USA. Back at the Roald Dahl Museum and Story Centre, Rachel White. I hear that Walt, nicknamed Roald Storky, isn't because he stalked him all the time, like a kind of shadowed him everywhere. No, um, it was because he was six foot five, like a beanstalk, beanpole. Oh, that sort of stalk. Uh, just he was very tall and thin, mm. and uh, he also couldn't pronounce Ra as well, the Norwegian name. Um, <laughs> and so I think it just was easier for him just to say stalky. Yeah. And in fact, in a we got a transcript of a meeting they had later on in the process. He's just referred to as stalky rather than Roald Dahl. So this is a copy of the actual book. Yes, oh. this is actual Roald Dahl's own copy of it. So he would have retained copies for himself and his family, and this is the one that survived. Mm -hmm. So you see, it's quite an exciting cover. It's red, it's got the yellow writing of the Gremlins from the Walt Disney production. A Royal Air Force story by Flight Lieutenant Roald Dahl. Uh, it has pictures of the Gremlins doing their sabotage of the plane while it's in flight. A blue aeroplane flying mm -hmm. towards us with three of the Gremlins, one sawing the wing off, or the, no, the, the guns off. Yeah. Another one's drilling into the nose cone. Are those bullet holes or gremlin holes? I think they're gremlin holes, but yeah. they're probably made to look like bullet holes so nobody suspects that the gremlins are the ones doing the damage. So it's, it's a mixture of uh, full page colour and then interspersed with the, the text are black and white pen and ink drawings. Yeah. So the first few pages show this incredible air battle between British and German planes with the swastika on of the German pilots and then they're zooming up are the British planes. It starts off at the Battle of Britain and these pilots are having a terrible time against the German planes but also their planes are being damaged by unseen forces and they work out that they're these little creatures called gremlins who are introduced over the next few pages. And gradually the pilots work out that they can encourage the gremlins to be good and they set up a gremlin training school and feed them used postage stamps as bribes and food. Um, there's a brilliant picture here, which I love, of Gus, who's the main protagonist, floating down in his parachute. His plane is it's in the background, crashing, and he's fine, but he's holding the little gremlin in a thumb and forefinger grip as he's floating down, and the gremlin's waving at him. And eventually, the main character, Gus, is invalided. He has the flu, he's not supposed to be flying, he has a crash and he's told he can't fly anymore. This obviously mirrors Roald Dahl's own experiences of crashing and being told he can't fly. But unlike Roald Dahl, Gus is helped by the gremlins. And the final pages of the story are the gremlins helping him pass a medical exam. Um, and here is this little picture here, which always makes me laugh, of Gus having to take his shirt off and all the Fifinella female gremlins have to turn their eyes, avert their gaze, very discreet. But they help him pass the test. So they, they basically get him to stand up and they tie little ropes around him to help him stand upright. He passes his medical and he skips off back to the airfield, ready to fly another mission mm. with the Gremlins following him. And that's how it ends. 50,000 copies of the Gremlins book were published in April 1943 by Random House, with another 30,000 in Australia. It sold out within six months. But the wartime paper shortage put pay to another print run. And thanks to his time in Hollywood, Dahl decided to make the most of his newfound fame, sending copies to influential people, including America's First Lady. Eleanor Roosevelt read it to her grandchildren and loved this book, and so I got invited to the White House. Work had already begun on the feature film, or as it was called in-house, Walt Disney Production 1551. Like Mary Poppins, the studio intended to make the Gremlins film a mixture of animation and live action, with the creatures as cartoons and the humans in film form. But, ever protective of his creations, this former irritated Dahl, who wanted it all in cartoon, even writing a letter claiming a Gremlin called Bottlenose Bill wasn't happy with the decision. However, Disney kept with the idea, and his top team of writers... Jim Bordrero and Ted Sears, who had worked on films like Pinocchio, Dumbo and Bambi, were assigned to develop the script, although Dahl insisted that they follow strict rules around the gremlins' behaviour. The list of rules was so long that the writers created a chart that would keep them oriented as to what was possible and what was not possible and what the motives were for each gremlin. There were different gremlins responsible for different types of mischief 
And then also there was a column on the same chart for the logical explanation for the mischief. By early 1943, the gremlins had totally captured the American imagination. With articles in Newsweek and Time, Count Basie even released this song, Dance of the Gremlins, There's a Gremlin in the Groove, that summer. Dahl biographer Donald Sturrock. Gremlins started to appear all over the US press and people were talking about them in all sorts of contexts. I mean, sports writers said, oh, gremlins were responsible for the local side losing a baseball. And Bob Hope joked that gremlins had ruined his recent book. I mean, they started to appear everywhere and I think become not so special and unique as they had been at the end of 1942. This caused concern for Disney and his team especially as he got wind of other studios now producing their own Gremlins-themed short cartoons. Paula sigmund Larry. He actually asked his brother Roy to contact the other studio heads and let them know that he was working on a feature film and would they mind holding off on their productions so that the public wouldn't be oversaturated with different images of the Gremlins before Walt's film in which he had invested so much was able to come out and all of the other studios pulled back on their gremlin projects. Perhaps also because of the conditions under which Walt was making his film as an agreement with the British Air Ministry with funds going to the RAF Benevolent Fund. In April 1943, Dahl visited the studios in Burbank for a second and final time. It followed a request from Disney to help inject momentum back into the film project, as his team were having trouble making the script work without their chief gremlinologist on hand. As a result, they'd also ditched the costly combination of live action and animation and went for full cartoon, which delighted Dahl. The May of 43 treatment by Sears runs about 155 pages, and it's really the best of the treatments. It's the closest thing we have to what the film might have looked like. The treatment begins with a dedication to the pilots of the RAF and British courage. Bless them all, bless them all, the long and the short and the tall. Bless all the sergeants and W01. The opening titles play over the wartime anthem Bless Them All, as a scene of the British countryside comes into view. The narrator states it is 1940. And soon there's an air battle with a German plane as a Spitfire is then forced to make an emergency landing. Next, a farmer sees the grounded plane and points out the bullet holes in the wing. And it's red-headed Scottish pilot called Scotty who says, They're not bullet holes, that's gremlins' work. Cinematic touches are then added, with the audience feeling they are flying, as the scene then shifts to a view that is from the cockpit. The scene then switches to Gremlin headquarters, where Cockney Gremlin Gus teaches young gremlins mischievous ways and to set their sights on human pilot Rip, who is said to look like a young Fred Astaire and doesn't believe in what he calls gremlin rot damaging planes. We soon see Rip catching a cold after spandules, those ice-breathing gremlins, create a chill in his room at night through a crack in the window. And the next day, against the advice of his fellow pilots, an unwell rip goes up in his plane, sneezes, and is then discovered by a German bomber. Rip soon sees Gremlin Gus alongside him, and fellow Gremlins start sabotaging the aircraft, saying, End of the line, lad, this is where you get off. We've nothing against you. It's the plane we're after. The Gremlins then help a groggy rip open his parachute as he falls out of his damaged plane and is rescued from the British Channel. Hitler appears in Berlin, ranting to his generals, blaming gremlins for the damaged RAF aircraft, and heads out to broadcast a speech to his nation. The scene then cuts back to a hospital in England, where an injured Rip is recovering. Gremlin Gus appears, invisible to medical staff, and argues with Rip about the destruction of the woodland to make aircraft hangars. But Rip wins Gus over by saying the Nazis would destroy gremlins too if they don't stop them. He adds, you represent the imagination. That's one thing the New Order can't stand. So to illustrate, Rip turns up the radio so Gus can hear Hitler's damning speech. The final scenes show German raids on London, with Rip attacking enemy planes, with the help of Gus on the wings sabotaging the enemy aircraft. 
Hitler blames the Gremlins as the Battle of Britain is won by the Allies. The end. And as the film gained momentum, so did the imagination of Disney staff. There was a funny incident that suddenly the gremlins popped up at the Disney studio and everybody was complaining that the gremlins were causing mischief. Films they were working on were falling apart and the ladies in the ink and paint department were getting runs in their stockings. So Jim Bodrero, who was one of the story artists, actually wrote in the studio newsletter that, no, 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 gremlins aren't here at the Disney studio. They can only be seen in the aerodromes or on the planes, and they can only be seen by the pilots themselves. Disney asked Dahl to come out for a third time in May 1943 for a couple of months, but Dahl couldn't because of his work commitments in Washington. Within the Disney studio, people were beginning to worry about the finances of the whole thing. Two of their most recent films, Pinocchio and Fantasia, had yet to turn a profit. Also, the project was becoming less relevant to the war effort, which was now pretty clear that the Allies were going to win. So the project started to stall. Disney initially considered making a short cartoon instead of a full-length feature. But just before Christmas 1943, the Gremlins film was no more. Especially as Warner Brothers had by now released the short called Falling Hair, starring Bugs Bunny and a gremlin. Walt felt he'd been scooped. So he wrote off his $50,000 investment and moved on. An explanation for the decision can be found in the minutes from a script meeting, which took place a few months earlier. Gremlins just weren't very likable. They were bringing down Allied planes, and combat pilots were the only ones who could see them. But here they are on screen, and we can see them. And it just set up a very odd sort of tension in terms of audiences' suspension of disbelief. Are they real or aren't they? Without Roald there to push the project, the writers started to wonder really what it was about. I think very few of them got it. And there's a record in the Disney archives of a script meeting where one of the script writers just said, well, I think the, the Gremlins were alibis for the stupidity and dereliction of duty of the RAF pilots. And I don't see that puts them in a very glamorous light at all. They couldn't really work out who the hero of the story was. They made perfectly fine short story fable characters. But once you put something on the screen, there's a lot more scrutiny of character development and character elements. The issue of copyright also remained a bone of contention for the studio throughout the project. Despite the British Air Minister's seal of approval for the Disney and Dahl version of The Gremlins, because the story was originally born out of an RAF myth, Several pilots came forward to stake their claim on the idea and Dahl's title of chief gremlinologist. Each time the studio or the RAF had seen off such claims, but it remained a constant worry in the back of Walt's mind. Plus there was Clause 12, the ongoing fear that the RAF had final say over the end product. Disney remained throughout the whole time that the movie was in production or development. This business of Clause 12 worried them this idea that somehow someone from the RAF might come along quite arbitrarily and say, we don't like it. Disney wrote to Dahl saying, every time I refer to Clause 12, I become a little apprehensive of what I might be facing. And that, given the amount of money required to make a feature, he said the studio could not, quote, be subjected to the whims of certain people, including yourself. Despite the film never making the big screen, Disney certainly had a key part to play in the launch of the career of one of the world's most successful children's writers, Roald Dahl, thanks to that very first publication of the Gremlins book. And it seems Dahl had no regrets about the experience, even though the planned feature-length animation never made it into cinemas. I remember when I was a young television director, I went to visit him at his house in Great Missenden, Gypsy House, to make a documentary film about Roald. And uh, he ushered me into the dining room, and uh, I noticed there were one or two of those early illustrations that he'd been given by the illustrators of Disney hanging on the wall. So he obviously, it was, I think it was something that he treasured and valued and was a source of many happy memories for him. Dahl and Disney did get to work together on the big screen, albeit posthumously, just over half a century later in 1997, with this, Disney's production of James and the Giant Peach. My name is James. That's what mother called me. My name 
And to mark the 100th anniversary celebrations of Dahl's birth this year, 2016, director Steven Spielberg has also united these two giants of storytelling via one particular big friendly giant in the Disney feature-length animation of Dahl's The BFG. Why did you take me? Because I hear your lonely heart. But the gremlins lived on during World War II, just not on film. The characters continued to appear in educational projects, and the Disney studio was doing a lot of work for the U.S. government, training films, and they produced a booklet for the Army Air Force's Safety Education Division, and it was called Meet the Spanduels. And remember that the Spanduels were the little gremlins who breathed ice, so they would be responsible for icing the wings of the planes. So this would teach the pilots how to fly and land in winter conditions. And so the life of Roald Dahl's gremlins continued to assist armed forces all around the world. The characters also appeared on military insignia designs that the Disney studio created for the uniforms and vehicles of servicemen and women during the war. But after that, anything having to do with the war, Disney basically put in the vault. If it could be recycled, he would recycle it. That was one of his specialties. But if it had to do with a topical subject like World War II, uh, once the war was over, that was it. But unlike Disney, Dahl recycled his gremlins, like in his book, Sometime Never, an adult novel published in 1948 about the end of the world in which humans blow themselves up. And it seems that Dahl just couldn't shake these little characters from his consciousness even right up to the end of his life. The Gremlins top and tailed his career, so obviously it was his first book in 1943. And then The Minpins, which was published just after his death in 1991, used some of the same motifs. These are little creatures who are under threat from a big, scary, unseen monster who wants to eat them. And little Billy is the human boy who enters the wood, is chased by the monster, but ends up helping the Minpins get rid of the monster by flying on the back of a swan. So that element of flight and mm -hmm. excitement of flying around and being in danger, creatures who live in trees with suction boots, very, very similar to the early story of the gremlins when they're living in the deep, dark, ancient British woodland um, before the woodland gets chopped down. It's fascinating that he came full circle. 